Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Guys, your high is getting better. It's not great. It's just getting better. It, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it, it could use some work. It's good to have you guys back. For those of you who are back from summer break, back at State, Point Loma, USD. There's a lot of colleges in the area, so I'm going to stop there because I'm going to run out, and then you're going to be embarrassed because I'm going to forget your college. Mesa, just learned that was a college. That's fun. John chapter <laughs> woo All right. One Mesa person here. Go Knights. What are they? Mesa what? They don't even have a mascot. <laughs> it's a community college, man. No one cares. I don't know. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, do they have teams? I don't know how it works. Do, do you have a team when you're a community? Do you, do you play sports? Someone tell me afterwards. Not right now. We got to get in the Bible. John chapter 20. We are at the resurrection of Jesus. Two weeks ago, we asked the question, is there good reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Last week, we asked the question, what does it mean that Jesus promises us eternal life? Someone's looking at me. Oh, this. Okay. Hey. Technology. And then this week, we're asking the question, what does it mean? Here you sit 2,000 years later, and a lot of the times when we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ tends to stop at the crucifixion, right? We are dead in our sins as believers. This is what the gospel is. This is what we believe. This is the establishment of our church. This is the, the root foundation of what Christianity is. We are dead in our sins. We are, uh, by in Romans chapter 5 says, we are enemies of God, that in that, we have all racked up a bill against ourselves in our sin, in our rebellion against God. Romans 3 verse 10, there's no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. John, or Romans chapter one, therefore the, the righteous, wicked, or the wrath of God is being poured out among the people. And so what do we do about this? Romans 5 verse eight, God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he need to die? Romans 6, 23, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, does it end there? No, the news gets better. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. And it gets better still. Romans 8, 15, we can receive adoption by which we can call the God of the universe Father. J.I. Packer is once quoted as saying, how do you simplify the gospel in the fewest amount of words? And he says, enemies become children. We can now know God as Father. So what do we do? Romans 10, 9 through 10, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But you see the essential aspect of the gospel message there in Romans 10, 9 through 10, is you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Sometimes resurrection, I think for Christians, is like the cherry on top of the pie. That's not you don't put cherries on pies. What do you put cherries on? Ice cream? Sundae? Cake? No one puts, I, I was going to say cake, but I've never seen someone like, hold on, the cake's not done. There we go. I wouldn't eat that cake. You wouldn't eat that cake, okay? But it, it just, it's like an afterthought, right? Well, you need someone to pay the price for your sin, so here's Jesus dead on the cross. Now repent and believe the gospel. And it's like, well, hold on. The New Testament writers, the New Testament martyrs, the early church fathers, the patristic people who were giving their life for this cause did not think of the resurrection as some sort of glorified cherry afterthought. It was essential doctrine. In fact, Paul's going to make remark that without the resurrection, there is no reason to believe in Jesus whatsoever. And so we're asking the question, what does it mean to us that the resurrection has implications on us today? John chapter 20. If you're new, we've been walking through the gospel of John for the past 6,000 weeks. And now we're in John 20. There's only 21 chapters, so we're about 30 weeks away from the end. John chapter 20, verse 1, 11, sorry. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Who's Mary? Good question. Mary Magdalene was a woman early on in Jesus' ministry who he cast seven demons out of. Now remember the context of the story of the resurrection. This is a uh, patriarchal, very uh, male-dominant, um, spiritualistic, Gnostic idea. Dualism was uh, well in play in the, the, the ideas of the, the Gnostic Greeks, that the flesh was sinful and the spirit was amazing and everything spiritual was good and everything fleshly was bad. And so if you had a demon in you, the, even the, the Pharisees asked Jesus if someone's blind or has some sort of disease or they're demon-possessed, what sin are they responsible for? Did they sin or did their dad sin? Who's responsible 
So in this religious context, if you had bad things happen to you or if you were a prostitute or something else like that and you had to do things that way or if you had a a spirit inhabit you as a demon or if you were blind or lame or deaf or mute, the question was, who messed up? And so there's a really interesting moment that we want to begin with remembering is that Mary Magdalene is a, potentially some people believe, was a woman of very ill repute. She uh, had, had, again, had seven demons cast out of her. Some believe that she, the, there was a level of promiscuity to her, that maybe her background was in prostitution. While we can't clarify any of those other beliefs, we at least know that she was demon-possessed and Jesus cast these demons out of her. So now imagine a woman who the reason she is free is because of this man who now lay dead. And, and just the, the desperate desire for some sort of reconciliation here, some, something happening. She's going back to the tomb, potentially because he's buried on Sabbath, right before Sabbath. So they couldn't do all the funerary arrangements they would have wanted to. So maybe she's coming back to finish that. And when she, it says this, she wept, uh, bent over to look into the tomb. So tomb was carved out of the rock. You would have typically had to kind of crawl in if you go to Israel today and you go into the garden tomb. You still have to stoop down. It's not made for people of our height these days, not even for them at that time. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? She responded, holy cow, angels. (laughs) Wouldn't you have expected that? Don't you want a heart so desperate for Jesus that anything else just won't do? Why wasn't this moment? Like she went in, she saw two angels and she said like the nunc dimittis from the, the earlier in the gospel. Like my eyes have seen the king. I can die now in peace. Lord, let your servant depart in peace according to your word. I've seen angels. This is sufficient for me. She says, bleh. Where's Jesus. I don't want your supernatural accoutrement. I don't want your characteristic accidents of resurrection. I want, she doesn't even pause in her rhetoric, right? When when other people in the gospel see angels, what's the angel's favorite response? Fear not. 365 times in the Bible, the phrase fear not comes in. Why? I don't know. I don't know why it's 365. You can guess yourself but I do know they're crazy looking. I do know they're very scary beings. Why? Because grown, like soldiers in armies meet these men and they act, they play dead like you would with a bear, a grizzly bear, not a black bear. (laughs) Don't, you don't play dead with black bears. We'll talk about that as the next sermon. It's so, we'll have a focus on bears, but not this one. You, you would just play dead. And, 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 and then you've got this woman who's so desperate for Jesus. She sees an angel and she's like, just tell me where he is. <laughs> they don't even go to their whole speech, right? Do not be afraid. She says, shut your mouth. Where's Jesus? You stop your whole angel junk. I need Jesus. At this time, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Why? I've, I've had skeptics tell me, well, which is a kind of a moving field goal post. They'll go, well, wouldn't you expect that this woman would have recognized Jesus after spending three years with her? And at the same time, if you're claiming that the Bible is written as a hoax, it's hard to rectify those two things. Why do you think the Bible would tell us that a promiscuous, demon-possessed woman found the empty tomb and then failed to recognize Jesus? If you were responsible for pitching and, and procuring a hoax for people to believe a fictitious resurrection— Would you have ever started with someone of such ill repute, with such bad witness, that doesn't even recognize the guy standing in front of her? Wouldn't you have eliminated that from the text? And then Joseph of Arimathea, who gave the tomb, came forward, and he was a very legitimate witness in the town. And he recognized Jesus from a thousand yards away because everyone knew it was Jesus because that makes the story a lot more robust. And instead, you have this narrative of a promiscuous woman with seven demons coming and not recognizing. In fact, she thought he was who? The gardener. Why? He's a peasant carpenter. That's who Jesus is. She mistakes Jesus for the hired help and goes, excuse me, have you seen where they put the dead man? Why are you crying? Jesus said to her. 
Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you took him, tell me where and I will go get him. Which is an ambitious response for a woman to go, you want to know what? You show me where that guy is. I'm going to, what, what? Pick him up? Carry him back? He's got 75 pounds of burial spices on top of his frame of a, of a Jewish carpenter who's probably yoked out of his mind. You're going to pick this guy? Show me where he is and I'll, I'll bring him back here. You got to love women like this that are like, what, I'll just, I don't need help. I'll do it myself, right? This is, this is the foundation of the church. Like this is, <laughs> who chooses this woman? Jesus does. He loves the upside down idea of his kingdom. He doesn't care what you think or what common cultural narrative you have about Jesus being anti-woman or misogynistic. It's trash, Jesus is sovereign over all things. He could have chosen anyone on planet earth to find the tomb empty. It wasn't a mistake. Jesus wasn't outside the tomb going, no, not her. The first time he announces himself as Messiah in the gospels is to a Samaritan woman at a well, promiscuous woman who's on her sixth husband at the time, five husbands and now just living with a guy. That's gonna be the first one he announces his Messiahship to. And now the first one to find the empty tomb is not who you would think. And God loves the fact that Jesus screws with your cultural idea of who he's supposed to be. I will go get him. Jesus says to her, Mary, that's it. It's just, it was the way that he said her name. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Why doesn't she recognize him though? There's a couple of different theories. My favorite one is this. Um, I don't know that Jesus when his body is glorified, right? When he comes back from the dead. We all have this hope that when we come back from the dead, when God glorifies us, the scripture talks about in the twinkling of an eye, he makes all things new. He will transform the flesh and we will, right? Uh, if, you're, if, you have, uh, um, if you're blind, if, you're, uh, if you have some sort of handicap in your life, it will certainly be done. Any mental problems that you're having, any physical ailments will be done away with. Why? Revelation 21, God says, behold, I make all things new. There'll be no more mourning, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. This is the truth and the promise of heaven. So what is Jesus doing with scars in his hands and a piercing mark in his side? I think it's because Jesus' glorified body and our glorified body are two different things. I think some of the depth of Jesus' beauty is not that those things are taken away, but that they're still there forever. Is his face still deformed from the beating he took? Is the crown of thorns impressed into his skull still there from him being ridiculed as the, fake, as the fictitious Jewish king? And the better question, does that ever go away? When you meet Jesus face to face, will you find him beautiful because his face is symmetrical or will you find him beautiful because he bears the scars that took away your sin? I'm inclined to believe that when God raised him, he kept him just as he was that that's the Jesus we're gonna meet and we'll find him beautiful, not from external beauty, but because we recognize when we look into his face that that's, what, that's the punishment that our sin bore on him and that's how deeply he loved us. This, only, this next phrase, I think, can only be said through a chuckle of Jesus. Jesus says, would you do not hold on to me, right? Like, could you imagine him trying to peel her off? Like, okay, hey, I've got, and almost like a joke, he's like, I still got stuff to do. I gotta go ascend. I gotta appeal to the disciples. I gotta go eat some fish. I gotta go tell Thomas he should stop doubting. I've got things to do. Go instead and tell my brothers that I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them all these things that had happened to her. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, which, why? Because they're still marked with scars. He's not going, hold on, I'll prove it. Oh, they're healed, never mind. That was my mistake. Because in the next section, he's gonna have Thomas put his finger through the nail holes in his hands and into his side, which isn't hygienic. Again, verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What level of centrality does the resurrection of Jesus have to the Christian faith? It cannot be overstated. The, the scripture bears witness to this and you ought to recognize this also. 
If someone produces the body of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we should abandon everything we're doing. There are secondary and tertiary motifs, secondary and tertiary doctrines in Scripture, right? If we believe something to be true about the way that we do church, if we believe something to be true, right? Um, if in the Old Testament there's a story of a guy getting swallowed by a fish named Jonah, and if in reality when he got swallowed by a fish, he actually got, the, the, the word fish was an ancient word that meant he was stuck in the crevasse of this rock system, and that's what swallowed by a fish meant, and we came to prove that there was not actually a giant sea creature, would it be upsetting to your faith? Sure. Would it destroy the, the central truth of Christian doctrine? No. We would have to go, wait, hold on, how do we rectify this with the other things? But that would be something that we go, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's a, something that we, we got to figure out. But if Christ be not raised, Paul makes it very clear, you should be pitied. You're a fool. If you're a Christian, this is what I, I can get asked sometimes too. So if we were able to prove that Jesus didn't come back from the dead, would you still be a Christian? Like I'm some kind of moron. No, I wouldn't. What do you mean? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't live out a blind faith. I run a ramp of reason that leads me to a leap of faith, but everyone takes a leap of faith. Whether you believe in God or you believe in the fundamental story of how everything began, that everything came from nothing and then life from non-life and then order from chaos and the sustaining of that order just because it's a ghost story that you tell. Like everyone has a level of faith, but you use your reason to take that leap of faith. And so, yes, if you produce the body of Jesus or you're able to qualify and prove throughout history that he wasn't dead, Paul says it himself. He doesn't say, oh, no, no, don't, don't look for the guy. Don't look at the empty tomb. Don't even ask questions about it. Paul constantly goes, go ask the guy named Cyrus over there. Go ask this guy, Alexander. He makes shoes over there in Corinth. The 500 brothers saw him at one time. Go ask. He keeps appealing to eyewitnesses who said, these are the people who watched him die. And these are the people who shook his hand. Go talk to them. He doesn't plant it in another town. The resurrection story of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus happens in Jerusalem. His death happens in Jerusalem. His resurrection happens in Jerusalem. Good. There's a pattern playing out there. Why is that important? Because do you understand if you were trying to create a hoax, you would have him live over in Jerusalem, but then you'd go preach it into the Cape of Africa. Hey, you weren't there. You didn't see it. You don't know. This is fictitious. I mean, this is real. A guy in Jerusalem. Why are 3,000 people gathered at the southern steps of the temple on Pentecost? Because they want to know what happened with this Jesus guy. They want someone to qualify why they're seeing things that they could not possibly be seeing. Just some uh, theologians on the topic of it, imagining a Christianity with no resurrection. Tim Keller writes, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. That's simplistic. If, if, if a guy calls his shot and that shot is his own death, burial, and resurrection, then that proves that he is God and that miracles are possible and everything that he said is the word of God, Right? You can have an alternative conclusion, like sometimes people die at the hands of Romans, then you put them in a cave and they come back to life serendipitously. And a, a really awkward moment, because this is the one guy who said he was going to do it, so that would really be a, a bummer for both the Jews and the Romans who were very, very inclined to keep this guy dead. But then he says, why would you worry about anything he said if he didn't? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like what Jesus said, it's whether or not he came back from the dead. The question isn't, do you agree with what Jesus says? The real question is, did he come back from the dead? Because if he did, he's God and what he says goes. And if he didn't, ignore him. He's a fool. He's a liar. John Stott writes this, Christianity is, in its very essence, it's a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. It is not a secondary or tertiary doctrine. It is not a cherry. It is the meat. It's the point. It's the, it's the root and if you get rid of the resurrection, here's what Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, right? That word futile, think about um, a phone that has no charge, a toy that has no batteries. It's a microphone that isn't connected to an amp. It looks like it has a point, but it doesn't actually serve its purpose. There's no power in it. There's, there, there's, there's no reason to believe it. It's, it's efficacious. It's salvific. It's going to do anything. It's pointless. It's futile. It's arguing with a rock. It's a waste of your time. Then those also who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, are lost. 
There's no point to, there's no afterlife. There's no anything, they're, they're, they're lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all the people most to be pitied. So if you give your whole life to a resurrection narrative that never happened, Paul says, then you have a really sad life. You should be pitied. You've missed out on a lot of stuff. You should go do whatever you want to do. Seize the day to the virgins to make much of time, as the poet writes. Go enjoy yourselves. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? This is the call of every pagan society of all time. Live a good life. Although we don't really know how to qualify a good life if there is no God. What's good? What's bad? Hitler has a different opinion than Mother Teresa. We just kind of chalk it up to, you know, whatever you feel is right. Live a good one. Whatever good means to you. You should be pitied above all things. This is us, okay? This is actually AI, which is kind of creepy. These people don't actually exist, but <laughs> here's what I want you to imagine. On understanding what's the power of the resurrection, what significance does it have in, our, in the gospel message? Imagine your life from the moment you're born, you sit down at a table and the world has pitched to you this idea and your sinful nature, Galatians 5.1, the spirit wants what's contrary to the flesh and the flesh what's contrary to the spirit. A buffet has been laid before you. The, uh, a salad of jealousy, the prime rib of murder, the, um, the, the biscuit of lust. <laughs> that shouldn't be a biscuit, but I don't even know. I'm forgetting what people eat at meals right now, and it's been a struggle for me. Uh, but you, and your drink, right, you're drinking in hate. It's like everything that you've done since the moment you were born, you're at a restaurant and you're racking up this tab, the first time you ever racked up a tab was the moment that you were born. The Bible says, into iniquity I was conceived out of my mother's womb. Romans chapter 5 says, I was, uh, I was born as an enemy of God. Okay? So we have, with absolute knowledge, because we're opposing the law written on our hearts, this is what Deuteronomy tells us, this is what John says, that God has written the law on our hearts. So when we hurt people, when we are bigoted, when we practice racism, when we do things of this, when we lust, when we commit adultery, when we steal and cheat and lie, no one goes, oh, I didn't know that was wrong. I'm sorry. I, you didn't want me to kill you? I don't, I, okay. I, newsflash, this is new for me. The scriptures seem to indicate that when we sit down at the table of life, we begin to order things and the, there, it's not super unclear for us what these things are going to cost us. We're going against our judgments. We're going against the law that is within us. We recognize these things as being wrong, but we order them nonetheless. I'll have more jealousy. I'll have more hate. I'll have more deception. I'll have more lies. I'll steal a little bit more. And we just keep engaging and ingesting and doing all these things. And then the moment comes where someone brings us our check and what those things have cost us. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And as we have eaten and as we drank deep those things that we thought were gonna bring us nourishment, two really interesting things happen. The first one is this. As we have tried to say, I have some hunger in my soul. I have some missing uh, ca uh, like chasm inside of me and I need to fill it. And so if these things represent material possessions, material wants and material desires, sex, money, and power, we have ate, we've drank so much and we find the bill to be incredibly outrageous and yet we're still hungry. This is what the book of Jeremiah says, that my people have committed two foolish things. They've rejected my living water and they've drank from broken cisterns that can't hold anything. They've thought their heart was gonna be satisfied by things of this world. Like your immaterial soul can be satisfied by trinkets and trimmings and trappings, the foolishness to think that the immaterial can be satisfied by, by the material. It just doesn't make any sense. And yet we're still stuck with this bill. And as death and as Satan and as the powers of darkness hand out all those checks, we rebelled against God, who is the great restaurant owner. We have said, I'm going to borrow from you, but I'm going to rebel against you in that. Thank you for the breath. I'm going to curse you with it. Thank you for my hands. I'm going to steal with them. Thank you for my feet while I go to dark places. Thank you. I have turned everything you've given me that was meant for worship, and I've turned it into rebellion. Here comes the check. And here's what happens to everyone as the check begins to be doled out. What in the world? Why? Because as you look at it, the very first thing, you were born, you deserve death. Wait, what? Jealousy, salad, death, this, death, biscuits, death, lust, envy, greed, strife, drunkenness, death, 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 death. 
And at the bottom, it says, you owe your eternal life. You owe your life here, you owe your life forever. And the deepest fools start to liquidate their moralistic assets. They start to go, oh, okay, so I owe an infinite tab, okay. Honey, we're gonna empty our 401k, right? This is foolishness. It's infinite. How comparatively, proportionally speaking, if any of you guys are statistics people, if you owe an infinite tab, how much closer does a billion dollars get you to an infinite tab? Zero percent. You are zero percent of the way there. This is what Christ has told us. You owe an infinite tab. So some of our moralistic do-gooders in life, the humanists, the humanists will go, well, don't worry, I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to empty out my, my moralistic bank account and I'm going to get closer. This is what the Pharisees did. They're like, well, I know it's an infinite tab, but <laughs> I'm better than Julie over there. So am I closer? God says, no, because you think you're better than Julie, you're, <laughs> you're actually further from me. God is near the broken heart and the downtrodden. He turns his face away from the proud. So no, you're further from Julie. You're further than Julie is. And Julie's messed up, right? Y'all met Julie? Anyone here named Julie? No one? That was divine. That was providential. That was great. And then to your surprise, this peasant sits down. Jewish carpenter guy sits down. You look at his clothes and you go, are, what are you doing here? Don't you see we're in the middle of a crisis? And he goes, I'll pay all of your tabs. Put all your tabs on my bill. I'll pay for all of it. And you look at him and some people go, I don't think you're able to pay my tab. You don't get how much I've done. You know how many jealousy salads I've eaten? A lot. With croutons of bigotry. <laughs> This analogy is going too far. I recognize it. I recognize that. But he says, I'll pay it. And the humble will go, well, shoot. <laughs> okay. Why? And Jesus looks at you in the face and he goes, because I loved you before the foundation of this world. I died on a cross for your sin. You don't even know me and I love you more than you'll ever know and love yourself. And in a moment, moment of faith, possibly in deep desperation, those of us who are in Christ have just gone, but my bill's as big as that guy's bill. My bill's bigger than that guy's bill. He goes, I'll, I'll take it all. Other people will go, uh, no, thank you. When I meet the restaurant owner, I'll pay my bill myself, but you're gonna find yourself bankrupt. And then some people just don't care. They don't even think about things of the bill. They don't think about the, the great redemption or the great reckoning of the tab. They just go, I don't care. I'm gonna, another jealousy salad, please. And put in some olives in this one. Olives of, of um, uh, stealing from the IRS, Okay. It's a long name for olives, but whatever. But those who are humble in heart will say, I, I don't know how you could love me enough to do this. I don't know how you could be willing to. I don't even know what it means that you're capable of doing so. And Jesus says, I'll prove it to you. The crucifixion of Jesus was him nailing all of our tabs to himself and him saying, don't worry, I can pay it. That didn't prove anything. That'd be like a 12-year-old walking in right here and going like, I'm going to pay all of your mortgages on all your houses. You should a little bit go, can you do that? I appreciate the gesture, but are you potent to do that? Are you powerful enough? Are you able? Do you have that kind of capital? And if you pin everyone's mortgages to a 12-year-old and then that 12-year-old, you look in his bank account and he's got like a Batman symbol and 13 cents, you would go, well, <laughs> you said, but you didn't. You just said but it didn't clear. You wrote a big check. There's no money in your bank account. What's the resurrection? The resurrection is the clearing of our tabs. It's the proof that his willingness was met by his potency to accomplish. If Christ be not raised, Paul says, we're still dead in our sins because the check that Jesus wrote didn't clear. If Christ be not raised, we'd be hoping Christ is the Messiah without a divine endorsement. There is no rubber stamp on Jesus if there is no resurrection. This is what the Old Testament says, we'll know who the one is that can pay the tab. Therefore, Psalm 16, this is a thousand years before Jesus shows up. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. I'm not afraid of death, why? Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Who is his faithful one? Jesus. He will not see decay. 
And because we are found in Christ, this promise is now imputed to us. We become his faithful one. This is the great trait of the cross and his resurrection, that we now become faithful ones in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became sin who knew no sin, that we could become his righteousness, the faithful ones. And if he doesn't let the faithful ones see decay, then I can rest assured in my death that I also will never see decay. Because he's faithful to do what he said. The other divine endorsement we get, Jonah chapter one. The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, it might seem like this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but when Jesus asked for a sign from the Pharisees, he says, I'm gonna give you one sign, the sign of Jonah. Because just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea creature for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So Jesus starts taking these Old Testament stories and he says, you thought Jonah was a story about a man getting swallowed by a fish, but it was just, it was just a foreshadowing to when the earth, when the sea creature of death is gonna swallow me for three days. But then, what does the Lord command? I'm gonna get spit back out resurrection power. So he uses these analogies to identify himself as the one we've been waiting for. Secondly, without the resurrection of Jesus to recognize the martyrs whose blood planted the church would be fearful of death. Without the resurrection, all the martyrs who willingly, 70 million martyrs in the history of the Christian church, 70 million people, they died. What was their assurance? They didn't go, well, Christ's crucifixion was a big deal. So I'm gonna, if someone loved me enough to die for me, then I'm gonna die for them. That's not what they stated as their assurance for dying. What did they state brought them confidence that they could walk to their death? It wasn't Jesus' crucifixion. It was what? It was his resurrection. As you walk through the death of the martyrs, this is a guy named Polycarp, or in English, many carp. Don't worry about it. It's whatever. <laughs> Some Latin major was like, yes, I love this church. <laughs> Many fish, Polycarp, okay, of Smyrna, AD 155. He finds himself in, as the bishop of Smyrna. He's well-respected. Then the, the pro-council of Smyrna issues a decree that from here on out, you can only worship the pantheon of gods and you can't worship Yahweh. So anyone who rejected the truth and the uh, veracity of the pantheon of gods, you know what they called them? Atheists. <laughs> so the first Christians were called atheists, which this is a great swap. Okay, because they didn't believe in the Roman gods. So they said, from here on out, you can't pray to or worship Yahweh. You can only worship the pantheon of gods. So they bring Polycarp in. They put him on trial. And the proconsul says, dude, we like you. We're gonna give you an out. Just renounce your faith and we're gonna let you go. They tried, the, the soldiers that were ca catching him actually tried to let him go because he was such a good guy. And yet he's before the proconsul. So they're like, dude, just say you don't believe in Jesus' resurrection and we can go free. And so he stands before him and they say, uh, all I need you to do is to say, I reject all the atheists away with all the atheists. And Polycarp, standing in the proconsul's praetorium, looks at all the pagans and he says, away with the atheists. And they didn't like that because they wanted him to reject the Christians who they called atheists. But instead, he pointed at those who loved the pantheon and he said, you're the atheist. They didn't like that so much. So they said, if you refuse to, re to recant, we're gonna feed you to our beasts. You know what Polycarp's response was? Call them then, bring on your beasts. And he says this phrase, for 86 years, I have served the faithful risen Jesus. I'm not gonna stop now in my moment of greatest problem. It's, it, he walked to the cross for me. I'm not going to abandon him in this moment for anything else because he lives. This gives me his confidence. They go, oh, well, you don't, you're not afraid of lions, the Barbary lion of the Colosseum? Then we're going to burn you. And he says, bring on your fire. You threaten me with a fire that burns for an hour and will be extinguished, but you face one that burns eternally. So repent of your sins and follow Christ. They put him in the middle of a group of people to burn him to death they said, we want to nail you to this stake. He says, you don't need to nail me anywhere. I'm not worthy to be nailed to a tree like my savior. Just let me stand. I'm not going to move. So they light him on fire. He stands still, but the, the fire won't burn him. Who's Polycarp, by the way? John's disciple. So the apostle John who wrote this, he discipled a couple guys in his life. 
His favorite person that he brought the message of Jesus to was named Polycarp. Okay, so he's a direct disciple of John. And so John, he won't burn. So they have to, <laughs> he keeps preaching. People start walking in because they think someone's baking bread. That's what, it sm- that's what his quote unquote burning flesh. So they walk towards him. He won't, so someone has to go in and stab him to death. Polycarp, the blood of the martyrs. Sebastian. Sebastian gets shot with arrows and then he survives and a Christian hermit woman comes in and and brings him back to health and then after he's done coming back from health after his execution attempt, he goes back and preaches to Diocletian and the the Roman proconsul again and then they club him to death, right? (laughs) But here's what he says. I have seen the glory of the risen Christ and go to join him. Christ has conquered and so shall we. Ladies, have you felt left out? (laughs) This is Blandina. A lot of women named Blandina these days. AD 177. She was tortured, pressed in a hot iron, fed to beasts, gored by a bull, and when none of that worked, they stabbed her to death. Here's what she wrote in her prison diary. I am sure I shall rise again. Cecilia, another lady. For some reason, women won't die as martyrs. I don't know why. It's just they were like superhuman. They attempted to suffocate her. That didn't work. So they tried to behead her, but they botched it. They hit her three times with a sword and she wouldn't die. So she survived for three more days preaching the gospel and helping the poor. I rejoice in the resurrection to eternal life. The the blood of the martyrs, which is the soil of the church under the persecution of Nero and Diocletian and all 70 million people, their confidence was not that Jesus really died. It's that he came back from the dead. This Polycarp is not five generations removed. He's speaking to the man who writes the Gospel of John. It's a direct witness, eyewitness to the resurrection. Thirdly, wrong turning right would be a hope but not a guarantee. You see, when Jesus is put in the ground, there is just a hope that, that injustice will be righted, but when he comes back from the dead, it proves it. J.R.R. Tolkien, Return of the King, he writes, Samwise Gamgee is talking to Gandalf, and he says, I thought you were dead! But then I thought I was dead myself. I love this question. Is everything sad going to become untrue? Tolkien writes later on the answer to this question. The birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus means that one day everything sad will come untrue. What a glorious promise. If you've experienced pain in your life, friend, injustice, suffering, tragedy, loss, sometimes the cross looks final. But the great metaphor of the empty tomb is that every wrong will be righted. How do we know this? This is the promise that God gives us in the scriptures. The cross is a kind of metaphor that reminds us that tragedy, suffering, and injustice may appear victorious. But the empty tomb reminds us of this. The great undoing is coming. When what happens Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things. That's our order right now. We are in the old order. What's the old order? Mourning, death, pain, brokenness, cancer, infertility, miscarriage. This is the old order. It's done in his new kingdom. And then in the present tense, Jesus says, he who was seated on the throne, this is the same one who came back from the dead, said, I am making, present perfect, poreo, I am making everything new. Four, we wouldn't have a basis for sure confidence in his future promises. You want to write that down, don't you? His promise, oh, confidence, future promises, Okay. Hebrews 6, 17, I love this. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. We have seen this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. When you go to swear about something in this life, which the Bible says you shouldn't because you can't do anything, right? Well, I swear I'll do this. You shouldn't do that. Why? Because you're not in control of tomorrow. You can't say, I swear tomorrow I'll pay you back. You can't do that because your life is like a vapor in the wind, here today and gone tomorrow. You're not in control. Who of you by worrying can add a single second to your life? So you can't say, I swear I will. But in the Bible, this is what the writer of Hebrews says. When you go to search for something to swear by, you find the most powerful thing in your life and you swear by that. I swear to God. I swear on my mother's life. I swear on whatever. And so it says when Jesus looks around for something to swear by, what does he swear by? Himself. Jesus goes, well, I swear by, well, I suppose it's me. (laughs) 
And then he says, and here's your assurance. The resurrection tells us that like a boat drops an anchor to stay steady and to stay true and to stay put. A, a, a fisherman drops an anchor into the ocean to drag on the floor so that they don't move in the water. And your soul should throw an anchor into heaven because that's where we find our security. We don't throw our anchor down. We throw our anchor up behind the veil of the curtain where Jesus is seated, the forerunner who has gone before us. This is our hope. Number five, the apostles wouldn't have a bold foundation to spread the gospel. Not just the martyrs, but what got them tortured and punished and imprisoned was not that they taught about a guy who had good ideas, but a guy who came back from the dead. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was powerfully at work in all. When they were looking for a new disciple to replace Judas who had hanged himself, one of their necessities was they had to be a witness of the resurrection because they know how deeply that changes people. Acts 23, verse 6, this is Paul after seeing a light in Damascus and changing his life. I am a Pharisee, he writes, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. He's not on trial because he became poor overnight. He's not even on trial because he said that Jesus taught some interesting things. He was on trial because he said a man came back from the dead. And lastly, the curse of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, were there no resurrection, Jesus' crucifixion would just have imitated the curse. It wouldn't have reversed it. The resurrection is a reversal of Eden's curse. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since death came through a man, this is Adam, right? It's going to connect it down here. The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Who's that? This is Jesus, Christ. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. So what is the, gar so think about two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree on the cross of Calvary. In the garden, we stole from man with our hands and Jesus' hand is pierced. We walked in fear of what was gonna happen and Jesus' feet are pierced. He is, the man is right next to the woman and his side is pierced. Man took from the tree. So what does God do? He puts someone back up on the tree. It's almost like this poetic reversal of what happened. God made Jesus sin who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21, so that we could become his righteousness. He's undoing the curse. But did the curse undoing work? Yes. Why? Because the tomb is empty. Romans 6.22, the groaning of this past age is now being met with the redemption of our bodies for in this hope we were saved. C.S. Lewis will conclude with this quote. The New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. He is the first fruits. This is a kind of thing of the idea of like appetizers. Jesus' resurrection is an appetizer for you. You get to think about that. It'll be your entree, but you're gonna get to look at it like an appetizer. This is the first thing that happens. He's the pioneer of life. He has forced open the door of death that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. May we be a church then that does not stop at the crucifixion of Jesus, which was so powerful, but we move to become resurrection people who live with a new hope, with the gusto and the fortitude and the vigor of the martyrs that say, because Christ lived, I'm not going to be embarrassed. Romans 1 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. What's the salvation? It's the resurrection of the man, Jesus Christ, accredited to God by miracles. Here's what he says in Acts chapter two. Paul, Peter writes in Acts chapter two, accredited to you by miracles, therefore repent and believe the good news of Jesus. That's who we wanna be. We wanna be a resurrection church. Would you pray with me? Lord, for the times in my life where I can get hung up on the crucifixion, which is so powerful, it's such a powerful display of your glory and your love for us. No denying. But I think a lot of the times I stop there and I forget the miracle and the hope that the resurrection brings. It's a, it's a sort of future game plan that you have brought to all of us who find our identity in you. I know that I'm gonna live again, not because I really, really hope in my own goodness, but I've seen you do it. And if you can make dead things live again and you do that for all of those who are in you, we can rest assured in that promise. Would you give us that boldness that only resurrection brings? We pray these things in your name, amen.